It's good to see everyone this morning. It's time to come in and take a seat. Uh, good to hear all the fellowship that's going on, and uh, we enjoyed a little bit of Java and some few treats over there this morning, so uh, thank you everyone who came over for that. Uh, it's good to have Dean Miller with us again. He got a great start yesterday, and uh, we're looking forward to today's, uh, both the sessions this morning, and then uh, breaking, all of us breaking and, and enjoying some lunch together. So uh, Dean will be speaking to us um, again, uh, living with loss is the theme of the whole weekend. Uh, Dean speaks regularly at Polishing the Pulpit and travels all around the country. I think he said yesterday 22 states he's been to and um, he even carries a 20 ounce bottle of water. He'll explain that later. But uh, <laughs> we bought 16 ounce bottles of water and Jeremy came up to me and said, I bought the wrong water. But, uh, it's still H2O. Um, it is wonderful to see the presence of everybody this morning. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, how good it is to be together and to open your word and discuss things that sometimes we don't normally think about, uh, but each one of us need, and uh, it is life, dear Heavenly Father. We know that we're living on this earth for a short time like a vapor, and we know then after that we have an eternal home in heaven. And those promises is what we live our hope in. We're so grateful for Dean and for what he has prepared for this weekend. And we're grateful for his safe travels, for him coming our way. We love you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dean, come speak to us. Are we good now with our sound system? It sounds like it. Could I have a couple of uh, fellas to come up here and uh, pass out? I'm not talking about like dropping to the floor. Distributing is what I mean, distributing. Uh, I have some things I'd like to uh, have distributed. Now the Widowhood Workshop Ministry does not um, give a trophy to everybody. We would like to make sure that each family represented here gets one of these booklets about grief. The booklets are written by the Williams brothers, Ron and Don Williams, and they um, have written these booklets and my ministry buys them from them and then we distribute them free to all the families who come to any workshop that we do with the Widowhood Workshop Ministry. And we want you to have resource material. We shared some things uh, yesterday as well. And by the way, if, uh, if you did not get, if you were not here yesterday and did not get a uh, notepad or a writing <coughs> pen, we want you to make sure that you have uh, one of those. And we will put them up on the communion table here where you can get them out whenever you would like. There are notepads and pens both up here. You know, in life, uh, we're going to experience loss. And a lot of that is out of our control. One thing that we all need to be real careful not to lose is our sense of humor. You know, people can lose their sense of humor. Proverbs chapter 17 says that a merry heart does good like medicine. There is great value in levity. You know, I think one thing that really helps uh, sad and serious kinds of stressful situations in hospitals and in funeral homes and in personal homes is children. Because children have no filter between their brain and their lips and they just say stuff and they do stuff. And they provide a lightheartedness that can really help us deal with the stress that we experience. So we make it a point uh, to not be serious all the time when it comes to these uh, workshops. And I wanna share with you a couple of things that might lighten the atmosphere here for a little bit. I hope that you prayed this morning uh, already. Uh, maybe you'd wanna take note of this prayer. Uh, somebody prayed and said, uh, Lord, uh, thank you for how well I've done so far. I haven't gossiped, I haven't lost my temper today, I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent, and I'm very thankful for that, Lord. Thank you for helping me. But in a few minutes, I'm fixing to get up out of bed. And from then on, I'm going to need a lot of help. Amen. 
I love uh, kids, and as a matter of fact, I met a kid yesterday. His name is Owen. He's at the door. He's holding the door. Well, did he run the 5K? He's going to run the 5K today, and uh, <clears throat> I hope he loses some of that energy during that 5K. <laughs> For the sake of anybody who's caring for that boy, uh, I could tell he had a lot more en energy than I want in my life right now. But uh, kids, uh, kids can be so much fun. This story is about two boys. Now I'm the, I'm the second of four boys. I I never I, one of the great cheats of my life. One of the things that I was never blessed with is a sister. Now now some of you men who have sisters probably would voluntarily give me your sister uh, at some point in time in your past life. But anyway, here's uh, two boys. You got you to gotta be really um, compassionate for parents who have boys like this. A couple of boys, they were eight and 10 years old, and they were uh, constantly mischievous, always getting into trouble. And they were getting into so much trouble that it came to the attention of their parents that a new preacher had moved into town. And he was an expert in straightening out kids. And so the boy's mother heard about this new preacher in town, and she decided to have him speak to her two sons. So the preacher agreed and asked, though, to see the boys individually. And so the mother sent her eight-year-old first in the morning, and the uh, older boy was going to be visiting the preacher in the afternoon. The <clears throat> preacher was a huge man, and he had a booming voice about him. And he sat the younger boy down when they were privately in his office and said, where is God? And, and the boy's blood pressure rose significantly. Um, and the boy's mouth dropped, and he just made no response. And he just sat there with his mouth hanging wide open. His eyes were wide open. And the preacher repeated the question with even a stronger tone, where is God? And again, the boy made no attempt to answer. So the preacher raised his voice again and shook his finger at him, where is God? And the boy screamed and he bolted out of the preacher's office and he ran directly to his house. He dove into the closet and slammed the door behind him. And when his older brother found him in the closet, he asked, brother, what in the world happened? The younger brother, gasping for breaths, replied, we're in big trouble this time. Dude, God is missing, and we are being blamed for it. <laughs> Don't lose your sense of humor. Boy, I am glad that God blessed us with the ability to smile and to laugh. Okay. I want to give you a little bit of introduction to the Widowhood Workshop Ministry. I'm going to make this as quick as possible because this is not the important part of our morning this morning. The baby that became eventually my wife was born in 1952, about an hour south of Cleveland, Ohio, in Dover, Ohio. And we were married for 41 years. We got married when we were 19 years old. Not something that I recommend to 19-year-olds, but we did it because, well, we wanted to. And we had the misconception that uh, money grew on trees, and uh, we found out that money uh, was needed to pay utility bills. And uh, life was pretty tough those first few years because I was a student at the time at Fried Hardeman College, it was called, in West Tennessee at that particular time. We were blessed with three daughters, and uh, they were raised right. Uh, they're all Ohio State Buckeye fans. And they spent uh, their growing up years before they left home and went to college at Fried Hardeman and then located in the southeast part of the country after they graduated from college. But uh, we're blessed with three daughters and they are married to good men. Um, <clears throat> two of the three of them are married to deacons in the Lord's church. And all six of them, my sons-in-law and my daughters in uh, and my sons-in-law are all active members of the Lord's Church. One is in <clears throat> the uh, Smyrna, Laverne, Tennessee area, not too far from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And then uh, I have one about 10 minutes away from me, 
which is in Villarica, Georgia, about 40 miles west of Atlanta on I-20. And then the uh, other daughter is in Gainesville, Florida. We were blessed with five uh, grandchildren, and I'm glad that my wife was able to at least see those grandchildren before she passed away. This picture was taken about 18 months after she passed away, and uh, it was a joy for her to be around those grandkids, though afflicted severely by Parkinson's disease. Can you imagine having a, a grandchild of yours placed in your uh, hospital bed at your home and you don't even have the ability to raise your arms to hug that grandchild? When was the last time you ever thanked the Lord for the ability to hug? Yesterday we talked about, if you were here, about how blessed we are and how we're always, always more blessed than we're burdened. But sometimes we just don't think about how blessed we are. You know, we do sing that song, Count Your Many Blessings, but that's almost become trite. It's almost become ritualistic. We need to think about the words of that song. We have a lot of blessings we haven't even thought about, and because of that, we haven't even thanked the Lord for. Have you ever thanked the Lord for the ability to get up out of bed? My wife couldn't do that for a long time. My wife lost the ability to go to the bathroom by herself. She lost the ability to walk. She lost the ability to talk. She lost the ability to eat. Have you ever thanked the Lord for any of those blessings? We are so richly blessed. But Parkinson's disease stole all those blessings from my wife. And I had to watch her lose those blessings. Life can be very, very difficult. Eight and a half years from diagnosis to death was her journey. She died on Christmas morning of 2013 at 940 in the morning. I watched her draw her last breath. And I was a mess. And it was about three weeks after she passed away, middle of January, 2014, I was sitting in an empty house and I said out loud, in an empty house, what's wrong with me? Now, I'm not a talk to yourself kind of person. Some of you look like you are, okay? But I'm not a talk to yourself person. That just popped out, it just popped out of my head and just like the kid without the filter, it just came right out of my mouth, out loud. What's wrong with me? I was really struggling. So I got the laptop out and I started looking for help for people who had lost their spouses. And I especially looked for ministries to help people who had lost their spouses and guess what I found? Virtually nothing. And that's when I started thinking, why haven't we done something? Why don't we have something in the brotherhood that can help people deal with loss and especially deal with the loss of a spouse? Because after all, there's only one way good marriages end. There's only one. I mean, there's all kinds of ugly ways bad marriages end, but there's only one way good marriages end. And are we prepping married people for that transition from being married to being widowed? And are we helping those who are experiencing widowhood, are we helping them like we should? And those kinds of questions are the kinds of questions that led to my family starting this passion project of ours. The Widowhood Workshop Ministry is my family's passion project. It's my family's response to the loss of my wife, my daughter's mother, my sons-in-law, their mother-in-law, and my grandkids, their nana. This picture was taken last year in July. Every month, a year in July, my family hosts a national widowhood retreat. I worked at youth camp for over 30 years in Lisbon, Ohio, and I always made it a point to make sure that the women were aware of the fact that we had ladies inspiration days. And we always made it a point of encouraging people to go to 
marriage enrichment seminars. But why had we not had anything for the widowed? And so my family, six years ago, we've done this for six years now. This July will be year number seven, if the Lord permits. We decided to host an annual widowhood uh, retreat. Some of the flyers are available out there on the ministry table in the foyer if you'd like to get one and take it for yourself or share it with somebody else. This past July, we had 158 widowed people from 15 different states. And the event is all about encouragement. Because what people need who have suffered great loss is they need encouragement. And especially people who have lost the dearest person on earth to them. And they are having to learn the brutal reality of the challenges of living without that husband or that wife. They need encouragement. And so this National Widowhood Retreat is all about encouraging the widowed. Well, we're going to talk, and I hope you're going to participate with me in talking about this. I will ask you a few questions. But we're going to be talking about the state of somebody, their life, after they've lost their spouse. Now, I'm going to give you a few statistics to help you put this in perspective. Because having perspective is, is really important about, about everything that's of value. We are a minority. Those of us who are living widowed are a minority. 6% of the population, but 65 years and older in our country, we're talking about a third of the people. Now, if you break that down male to female, there are a lot more widowed females than there are widowed males. Look at that percentage for the women, 37%. That's way over a third of the women 65 years and older are widowed, 12% of the men. If you drop that number from 65 down to 55, even 55 and over, almost a third of the women are widowed, 9% of the men. Now, you may wonder about why there are so many more widowed females than widowed males. I'm going to give you two facts, and then I'm going to give you two spins on those two facts. Fact number one, the lifespan of a woman is longer than the lifespan of a man. That's a fact. Now, my interpretation of that fact is, us men take such good care of you women, that's why you live longer than we do. So, we are to blame for that, and we assume full blame for that with great pride. Fact number two, statistically, Women have a tendency, more often than not, to marry men who are older than they are. What are you all thinking? <laughs> That's your fault. If your lifespan is going to be longer than the lifespan of a male, typically, and then you marry somebody who's older than you are, that's going to create a lot more widowed females than widowed males. But we are a minority. But there are at least 15 million, sometimes the number is as high as 20 million in our country who are widowed. And one of the things I wonder about is who is ministering to these people who are having to live with a significant loss in their life. The kind of loss that has really shaken the foundation of their life. 1.4 million people give or take a few, every year in our country lose their spouse. 6% of them are under 44 years old. The most impressive people that I've met since my family started this ministry are young women in their 20s and 30s who've lost their spouses. I wish we had a Partridge family bus. Those of you who are younger, you'll have to Google a picture of that bus. And I could take you around and visit some of these widowed females. We could go down to Southwest Georgia and we could visit with Buffy. Buffy is a teacher in a faith-based school and every day she called her husband at lunchtime. And one day she called him and she hung up and she was concerned and she went directly to the car and started driving home, but it was a 45 minute commute to get home. She called her dad on the way to her house. Her dad, a law enforcement officer, she told her dad, dad, Please go to the house. I'm concerned about him. It's a good thing that her father got there first because her husband had taken his life. They had a child a little over a year old 
at that time. We could get in that bus and go from southwest Georgia to West Tennessee, and I could introduce you to, to Brittany. Brittany was married to Bradford, and Bradford was the kind of good-hearted man who wanted to help kids. And so that's how he was academically trained. And he was up in Trenton, Tennessee, and in Trenton, Tennessee, when he was up there, he was in an awful auto accident, and he died as a result of that accident. They were married for a little over 1,300 days. And the reason I know that is because Brittany wrote a blog about her experience after Bradford died in that accident. She got up one morning as a young lady, and she was married. And before the sun went down that day, she was widowed. And only having been married some 1,300 days. Doesn't sound fair, does it? I could take you to Middle Tennessee, to Salina, and I could introduce you to Emily, who when she was 34 years old, a few years ago, at age 34, she's awakened one morning by her 36-year-old husband having a heart attack. She pulls him off the bed because she needs a hard surface, and she starts administering CPR. She calls 911, he's taken to the hospital. And a few days later, she posts something on Facebook that I will never, ever forget. I can still hear that beeping in my head. Beep, beep, beep. As his body was being transported from his room to the operating room where they were going to harvest his organs because he had intended on being an organ donor. And so Emily, at age 34, is widowed, and they have a daughter, little Evie, who I think at the time was about first grade. Cynthia, her and her husband were big farmers, and he, and he went out to, to do some welding. He had a truck out there that had a, a diesel tank on the back of it, and he went out there to weld on that tank, and, and he cranked the welder up. And, and that tank had 75% diesel fuel in it and 25% fumes in it, which was not a problem. But what was a problem that he wasn't aware of is there was a pinhole leak in that tank. And when he cranked that welder up, it blew up. It blew his body out of the building. Cynthia went and dampened a bunch of comforters and blankets and went out and threw them on her husband's body. He was life flighted to Memphis, and he died a couple of days later. The cotton is white out in the field. And I was really proud of those Crockett County farmers who that fall, fall left their farms and came and harvested her crop. They had three kids, 29 years old. See, you don't have to be old to be widowed. All you have to be is be married. And all married people are prospective widowed people. I don't say that to scare anybody. I say that for the same reason God talks about death in his book, to help us with our life. You want to live? I mean, really live the way God wants us to live? Remind yourself of what God says about death, about how inevitable it is and how unpredictable it is. That helps you with everyday life. So I don't say anything about widowhood in the presence of married people to scare them. I share those thoughts to help inspire those married people to be the best marital mates they could possibly be. 78% of the widowed are, are women. Most of the research done, most of the books written, most of the articles that you'll find about widowhood are written about being female and being widowed. There's about 245 million widowed females in our world. 115 million of them, they estimate, live in abject poverty. One of the most touching articles that I have ever read in print was in the National Geographic in February of 2017. This National Geographic magazine has an article in it about the widowed females in India. And I could not believe that in our day and time that 
human beings could be treated like the withered females are in India. I mention that because, you know, the missionaries that we support in different countries, one of the things that we need to be making sure that we remind them about is the practice of pure and undefiled religion involved in that caring for the widowed people when we're starting these mission works in different countries. China has the most widowed people in it of any planet, any nation on planet Earth. India is second. Both of them have over 40 million widowed females in them. We have somewhere between 15 to 20 million. Now, I'm going to ask you to think out loud with me. In God's book, he describes himself as the defender, reliever, and protector of the widowed. Now, what does that tell us about God and the widowed? That's not a rhetorical question. I'm asking for a response. I'm not going to call on anybody. But somebody tell me, what does that tell us about God and the widowed? Loves Concerned, loves. Okay. What else? Why would he be concerned or love them? What's the big deal? Why? Why specifically the widowed? Okay, they're vulnerable. They're in, a, they're in a very challenging period in their life, a very difficult phase in their life. They have lost a precious blessing in their life. They've lost their marriage. And boy, especially in the ancient culture, you have these women who are very vulnerable and can be in desperate situations because they've lost their spouse. Now, God cares about them. God, God loves them. He also is aware of their situation, that it's not normal, that it's definitely challenging. Let me give you a mathematical equation about effective ministry. Knowledge plus compassion equals effective ministry. Knowledge plus compassion equals effective ministry. Compassion alone does not equal effective ministry. Knowledge alone does not equal effective ministry. Knowledge plus compassion equals effective ministry. Have you, have you ever neglected somebody because you didn't know what they were going through? It wasn't because you, you didn't love them. You didn't have compassion for them. If you'd known what they were going through, you would have been there for them. You would have done something for them. You would have at least attempted to have helped them. But see, a lot of times we don't know. Tomorrow morning, if the Lord permits, we'll have a bunch of people in this room. And don't be naive about the people in this room. You're naive if you think that when we get together tomorrow morning, that there aren't marriages that are troubled, that are tanking, or maybe at this time, a train wreck. If you think that, that there are no men in here, in this room tomorrow morning, that are struggling with a pornographic addiction, you might be naive. If you think that there aren't some people who are dealing with some form of mental illness, you're probably naive. Boy, we're a mess. We live in a broken world and, and we have burdens. We, we have things that we're struggling with in our lives. But a lot of times we don't assist one another because we don't know what they're going through. You know, it's good to be independent, but you know, it's not good to be independent to a fault. Sometimes we don't like to concede the reality that we need help. Sometimes we refuse to desire help. We don't want help. We want to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And how arrogant is that? When God has provided a church family, his divine support group to help us. Yet how can we help if we don't know? Now there's sometimes people are neglected because we don't have compassionate hearts. I surely hope that that's never the case with us though but we also need to know. How in the world could you possibly minister to somebody, a parent, for instance, who has lost their child to the world? 
not to death, to the world. How could you possibly minister to that parent if you didn't know that they were going through that and what that was like? And what about the person who is struggling with the loss of their health? And and you're healthy, and you've always been healthy, and you don't know what that's like. And if you don't know what that's like, how in the world are you going to be able to help those people? What about the person who's lost their spouse? How in the world could you possibly help somebody if if you don't know what they're going through? I admit that I neglected my own mother. Even though I'd promised my dad, Dad, if you die because of this surgery, I remember right where I was when I told him this. I'll make sure that mom's taken care of. Well, he survived that surgery, but later he did die. And I didn't understand what her needs were until I became a widowed, a widowed person. And then I started reading passionately everything I could get my hands on about what other people had experienced. I was sitting in a, in a rehab unit in her private room. This was after dad had passed away. And now I need to preface me telling you this story with a reminder. I'm the second of four boys. The, the most Uh, The thing I'm most proud of in regard to my mother is she never spent a day in a mental institution, though she raised four boys. We were not good boys. Um, So I'm I'm sitting in her private room in a rehab center, and she said, I'm going to give you a moment of silence, because there was dead silence before she said this in the room. And after you experience a moment of dead silence, I'm going to tell you what she said. Now, just me and her were in the room. I wish I had a daughter. I was shocked. Now, I have a tendency to be like the Apostle Peter and say stuff I later regret, okay? I've always been that way. I'm getting better, but it's about time. But anyway, so she says, I wish I had a daughter. And now internally, I didn't say anything right away. Internally, I thought, Mom, what am I, chopped liver? I'm here, come on. But God granted me a high degree of self-control on that occasion, and I didn't say anything. I let a few more moments of silence go on, and then I'm going to tell you what I said in response to her. This was a stroke of brilliance. I don't have strokes of brilliance very often. Mom, I wish you would have had a daughter too. To this day, I'm so proud of myself for saying that. And I'm, I'm sincere. I'm totally sincere. I felt like for years I'd been cheated because I didn't have a sister. I would have traded three brothers for a sister in the blink of an eye. That would have been an easy trade. I would have won the lottery. You women are so perfectly gifted by God to be better nurturers and better caregivers. God has gifted you with a heart of gold. I mean, I know us men can be good caregivers, but it takes a lot of effort, a lot of work. You are the ones that are the tender, nurturing gender. I understand what she meant. Sometimes we just don't realize what people are going through and how difficult and how challenging their circumstances can be. We need to know about what one another are going through And we need to have compassionate hearts. And when we know and have compassionate hearts, that will produce effective ministry. Now, in the Psalms, the wicked are described as those who would not care for the widowed. They would have no problem slaying the widowed. When Job's friends were in their theory of retribution, thinking that the reason Job was suffering is because he had sinned a lot, They even suggested some sins that he may have committed that caused him to be suffering so greatly. And one of them was, Job, you you probably have sent widows away empty, and that's why you're suffering the way you are. But the reality was, in chapter 29 of the book of Job, he said, I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. He ministered to the widowed. See, even in that ancient culture, you did not neglect people who were widowed. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, there's a section of scripture here that I want to read a portion of. 
This is Deuteronomy 24, starting at verse 17. Now, this passage is when they're getting ready to cross the Jordan River. They're going to go in and to the land of Canaan, and they're going to engage in military battle. Now, if I were God, and it's a good thing I'm not and wasn't and don't want to be, I would have sent Moses an email to then also hand to Joshua, and it would have been about military engagement the policies of military engagement and where to stash people and where to cross the Jordan River and how to be most successful in military battle. But God doesn't have Moses talk about any of that stuff. God gives Moses a message about two things. Here's how I want you to be and here's how I want you to behave. That's the focus of attention. Do you know that's always been God's focus of attention with us? God in his book was telling Israel And God in his book in the New Testament is telling us, this is how I want you to be and this is how I want you to behave. With that in mind, Deuteronomy 24, 17. You shall not pervert justice to the stranger, the fatherless, nor take a widow's garment for a pledge. Now there are three life circumstances mentioned there. Notice, stranger or foreigner, depending on your translation, fatherless or orphan, and then widow. What do those three life circumstances have in common? What is the common thread with those three? Anybody? They're not all prospering. What is the common thread? They need help. They're in an unusually challenging life circumstance. Now what's interesting is, take your concordance or if you have some sort of computer program, do some research about how many times these three life circumstances are linked in Scripture. Sometimes two of the three, sometimes all three. They're all people who are struggling. Now, I am not going to suggest that God is simply denoting these three categories and asking them to exclusively be concerned about them. I think what you have here is what in English class your, your English teacher would call a synecdoche. You know, when a, uh, when a couple of guys are talking uh, about their ranches, one will ask the other, how many head do you have? Well, he's not asking about head. He's asking about the whole cow. You know, how many apart standing for the whole? He's talking here about people in difficult life circumstances. He happens to cite three, I think, as a part standing for the whole. He's challenging them to be compassionate. Very next verse. But you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and that the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do, this, to do this thing. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back and get it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the bows again. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather your grapes of the vineyard, you shall not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. Why does he mention Egypt? Not once, but twice. Why does he mention Egypt? He's telling them to be compassionate toward people who are in difficult life circumstances. Why does he bring up Egypt twice? He was compassionate to them. I've been compassionate to you. You be compassionate to others. I heard your cries. I responded to your cries because you needed help. You were in an awful situation. You be that way with others. And then he cites three very common life circumstances that ought to be objects of compassion. The stranger, the fatherless, and the widowed. And again, these three are often linked together in Scripture. And again, I think as a part standing for the whole, he's simply challenging them, I want you to be compassionate. And here's how I want you to behave as as compassionate people. I cared for you. You care for others. The same thing is true of us. God cares for us. God blesses us. Every good and perfect gift is from above, James 1, 17. It comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation nor shadow cast by turning. God blesses and blesses and blesses. Now we need to bless others. We need to be compassionate toward others who are struggling with a difficult circumstance. 
But if we don't know they're struggling and we don't know anything about their circumstance, clueless people cannot effectively minister to others. We have to become more knowledgeable. The sad reality is, I'm not going to turn to it for the sake of time, the sad reality is that in Isaiah chapter 1, God has to send Isaiah the prophet to them and reprove them for not doing what he challenged them to do, what he told them to do in Deuteronomy 24. They were not compassionate. They had denigrated to becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, in Isaiah chapter 1, if you read that passage, they observed their Sabbath, the feasts, the festivals, they gave their tithes, they offered their sacrifices, but they were not compassionate to people who were in need. We can make the same mistake. We can come to every Bible class. We can be here at every worship service. But where's our compassion? Where's our compassion every day? Where's our love and concern for other people? That should spring from our close relationship with God. Because we want to be people after God's own heart. And God has a heart of compassion. Now, it was so sad that in Jesus' day, in the gospel records, he accuses the Jewish people of devouring widows' houses. They not only didn't care for them compassionately, they took advantage of them. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, there's mention of the first weakness, ministry weakness, of the first century church. Now, when you stop to think about what happened in Acts chapter 2, you have all these people from all over the inhabited world who come to Jerusalem. And they come just like they've come in previous years. They knew when they were coming, and then they knew when they were coming back home. But this year was different. This year something special happened. This year the Holy Spirit came, and the church was born. And thousands of people became Christians. And they were staying in Jerusalem. Imagine an influx of people into Carter County. Isn't that right? Carter County. Imagine an influx of people into Carter County who, when they come, they all have some sort of thing that causes them to have to stay way longer than they intended. Can you imagine the ministry challenge that would be? And you know, when you read chapter 2 and you read up through the first part of chapter 6, you keep reading about the number of the disciples was being added to, the number of the disciples was multiplying. Can you imagine what a ministry challenge that would be? Because these people have come from all over the inhabited world and they're staying way longer. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever gone somewhere on a trip and something happened? It may have happened with a car. It may have happened an illness or an accident. You end up staying way longer than you intended. There's all kinds of nitpicking details, stuff that practical things that have to be taken care of. Imagine thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming to Jerusalem. Wayne Jackson, in his commentary on the book of Acts, suggests that probably by the time you get to Acts 6, verse 1, you're talking about a church of somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000. Wouldn't that be awesome? The singing in a church of 20,000, wouldn't that be awesome? You know what wouldn't be so awesome? Is the ministry headaches with a group that large who have come ill-prepared for this experience? but you don't read a single thing about any of that ministry challenge. The, the first ministry weakness of the first century church mentioned in the Bible is Acts chapter 6, verse 1, and look at what it has to do with. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. I think there's a reason why. That is the first ministry weakness mentioned. It's surely not the first ministry weakness experienced. It's the first ministry weakness mentioned. The life of a person who has lost their spouse is near and dear to the heart of God. Is it near and dear to the heart of his people? 
I'm going to ask you to look at this sentence. I'm going to ask you to go all the way back to English class. And I know for some of you, that was probably a nightmare. Some of you probably slept through it. But I'm going to ask you to look at this sentence as an English student. And I'm going to ask you to identify the subject of the sentence. It's one sentence. What's the subject of the sentence? Somebody? No modifiers, just the subject. Religion. Religion. Religion is a bad word in our culture today. It's not a bad word in the eyes of God. It's in his book. The word religion in the English language comes from a Latin word, religera, which means to bind back. It's very uh, close kin to the concept of reconciliation in the New Testament. Reconciliation is making friends again. It's the idea of people being uh, separated, like a married couple separated, and then they reconcile, or maybe they even go through a divorce and they are reconciled. Okay, that's the idea of religion. It's the idea of man being bound back to God. It's not a four-letter word. Count the letters. It's not a four-letter word metaphorically either. Religion. Okay, what kind of religion, though? There are modifiers. Nouns can be modified by adjectives. What kind of religion? Pure and undefiled. Now, in whose opinion? In whose perspective? In God's. Before God and the Father is this. Now, if there's pure and undefiled religion, what does that necessarily, logically, imply? If there's pure and undefiled religion, what else must there be? Impure and defiled religion. I've got news for our culture, and I'll die on this mountain. Not all religion is right in the sight of God, exclamation mark. Not all religion is right in the sight of God. That is a fact. There's pure and undefiled religion, and then there's religion that's of no value. As a matter of fact, the previous verse in James 1 and verse 26 references that very thing. Meaningless, valueless religion. There's right religion and there's wrong religion. And there's right religion in the sight of God. That's what this sentence is about. Now, what is involved in this? What two verbs? Now, is is a part of the beginning of the sentence. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is. Okay, now, the two verbs after is, what are they? Visit and keep. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. And the idea of the Greek language there is keep on keeping yourselves unspotted from the world. God is a holy God. Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah had this amazing vision that blew him away. He saw the Lord sitting on the throne and he heard these words, holy, 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 and he was blown away. I'm a sinful man. I'm in the midst of a sinful nation. He was profoundly impressed with the magnitude and majesty and glory of the holiness of God. That's the way we need to be. And when that is in our heart, we want to be passionately committed to keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. We don't want anything to do with the sin of the world. Do you know what a part of right religion is in the sight of God? It's passion for God. Passion for our holy God. Now there's another verb. It's the verb visit. Now, that verb visit has two objects. What are the two objects of that verb? The orphans and the widows. Now, the word visit comes from a Greek word that if you saw it transliterated the way it is on the screen there, E-P-I-S-K, if you saw that transliterated word, and then you were to look at what the Greek word transliterated is for bishop, which is an overseer, they're very similar. If you looked at those two words transliterated, you'd say, man, they're kind of kissing cousin words. They're kind of similar, and they are. Because the word visit here has to do with overseeing a situation. 
looking over and overseeing a situation for the purpose of addressing the needs in the situation. That's what this word visit is about in James 1 and verse 27. Now let's go back to this. This word uh, visit. Now, who are we supposed to be visiting? The first life circumstance is the orphans. What have we done in the church to minister to the needs, to look over and address, inspect, and fulfill the needs of children? What have we done in that regard in the church? We have children's homes, don't we? All over the place. Tennessee Children's Home is a tremendous ministry. East Tennessee, West Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, three different campuses. A lot of kids are being helped. By the way, these children's homes that we have, like Potter Children's Home in Bowling Green, Kentucky, like Midwestern Children's Home on the north side of Cincinnati, Ohio, or in Valparaiso, Indiana, Schultz Lewis Children's Home, they're all over the place. Do you know they're not orphans? We used to call them orphans' homes. There used to be debates. Those of us who are older, who remember back in the 50s and 60s, there were debates in the Brotherhood about how these children's homes, or if these children's homes, should be supported by the church. But they're children's homes now. They're not orphans' homes. We're ministering to children who are in need. These kids are in unusually difficult life circumstances. Let me share with you a few. My dad beat my mom. When I was five, my dad got arrested for robbery and went to jail. That was the last time I saw him. Lots of days we didn't have no food in the house. I stole food from the store for me and my sister. Sometimes we didn't have a place to live. We slept on the street. My mom did drugs. I see that nobody really cares to even see if I'm okay. My mama can't give me the support I need because of work and her other kids. One of the things that I have always wanted was for someone to be here for me. When I was in fifth grade, my brother died. And then in sixth grade, my dad died. I started using drugs. In seventh grade, I got a gun. In eighth grade, I started doing meth. James had dreams and nightmares. He was mentally and physically abused. His parents divorced, but his dreams and nightmares continued. He was being sexually abused by a man who his mother brought into their home. And desperately wanting to get out of that situation, he quit bathing himself, hoping that he'd be so repulsive that nobody would want to be around him. The state took over James's life when he was five years old. He was malnourished, he lacked social skills, and even basic verbal skills. Eventually, at age 13, he was taken into Tennessee Children's Home. I could go on and on and on how compassionately we are ministering to kids who are in desperate situations. Some of them have personal problems. Some of them have families that are just highly dysfunctional. And what we're doing with these homes is we're compassionately ministering to them. I hope that we also encourage adoption. Let me suggest something to this church family. If there's ever a couple who decides that they would like to adopt, you know, I was shocked when I found out about how much that cost. If there's a couple that has that kind of heart and they want to do that kind of thing, I think the church ought to pay every dime of the thousands of dollars that it costs to adopt a child. What a great ministry that would be for the whole church family to back that couple who wants to raise that child. That's compassion for children in need. I love what I hear and have a chance to talk with parents who have chosen to be foster parents. Those are great, compassionate ministries. That is right religion in the sight of God, showing compassion for people who are vulnerable and struggling in their lives. Now, there's a second object of the same verb in the same sentence, in the same verse in the Bible. 
What's the second object? You see it there. It's the widows. For decades in my life, I neglected the widowed community. It wasn't because I didn't care. It was because I was clueless about what they were experiencing. I had no idea. I had never read one book, not even one small book about widowhood. Oh, I'd read books about grief. I'd even taught grief classes, but I had never read one book written by a widowed person about their life after loss. You know, whenever my wife passed away, I was 32 years with the same church in Hartville, Ohio, just outside of Canton, Ohio. And during that 32 year period, I was with the vast majority of people who suffered great loss in our church family. And what I clearly understood from that experience was loss was an awful thing. I mean an awful thing. I saw those tears and I cried tears with them. And I heard their cries. And we hugged. And I preached at a lot of memorial services. But you know what I was ignorant about? Oh, I knew about the power of loss. But what I was clueless about was living with loss every day and every night afterwards. See, we go home. After the memorial service, we go home to our normal life. There is no normal. There is no normal for that person who has lost their spouse or has suffered some other great loss. They go home to a home that's no longer normal. And they're going to struggle mightily. It's because of my ignorance about living with loss that caused me to be neglectful for many years in my life. Not no more. The first line of ministry for the widowed, and it's not moving either direction. There we go. Okay. The first line of ministry for the widowed, and we'll finish with this. We're at the hour mark now. The first line of ministry for the widowed is not the church, it's the family. But are we in our churches teaching our families about what it's like to be widowed? So they know how to care for their widowed parent or grandparent who is widowed. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3, beginning. Honor widows, and the word honor there means care for. Honor widows who are really widows. Well, that's kind of insulting, as if you could not really be a widow. But watch how he defines this. Honor widows who are really widows, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, see, there's the distinction, let them first learn to show piety at home and repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. And then verse 16 of this passage. This is the longest passage I know of in the New Testament about this subject. Verse 16 says, If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them. The idea is give aid to. Give aid to them and do not let the church be burdened that they may relieve those who are really widows. W.E. Vine in his expository dictionary of New Testament words suggests that there's kind of a hint in this passage that what has been going on here in the first century is families are pushing off on the church their personal responsibility as a family to take care of their widowed parents and grandparents. And God, through Paul, is saying, no, we need to stop this. This is first a family responsibility. Verse 8 is right smack dab in the middle of this passage about Families caring for the widowed. Verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I quoted that passage many years, encouraging men to get a good job and support their families without realizing the context of that passage isn't talking about that kind of support. But if anyone does not provide for his own, his own what? His own who? And especially those of his household. He's talking about widowed parents and widowed grandparents. That's what the subject of the text is about. Evidently, there were families who were neglecting their responsibilities. Now, you might say, well, then we don't really need to have a widowhood ministry in the church because that's a family responsibility. Do we have youth ministry in the church? Who's supposed to raise kids? Parents. Why do we have youth ministries in churches? 
to help the parents because they need a lot of help. Because we believe in family. And so we want to support those families in those efforts to provide the best possible environment for their kids to grow up and become wonderful, strong Christians as adults. With the same principle, churches need to assist families in becoming more knowledgeable about how to care for their widowed parents and grandparents. And it's great to have local widowhood ministries to reach out to the community. This town is full of hundreds of widowed males and females. With the dysfunction in our families and our culture, how many of those widowed people in this town or in this county are really being ministered to effectively by their families? My suspicion is very few. What a great outreach for a church to reach out to their community and start a local ongoing widowhood ministry to help their families in the church and help also their community. What are we going to do in regard to ministering to the widowed? And Dr. Seuss has been canceled by a lot of people, but not by me. And he's right. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot nothing's going to get any better. It's just not. I hope that you're increasing in your knowledge. And I hope that not only have you had thoughts provoked, but maybe hearts touched by sitting in this room this morning. We're going to take a brief break, about 10 minutes. And the, the second session is a visit into the head and heart of a widowed person. You want to know what it's like to be widowed? You'll know when we finish that second session, and it won't just be from my perspective. I really appreciate you being here. I really do. You could have been somewhere else, but you chose to come here. Consider yourself praised for that choice. Let's be dismissed for a little bit. Ten minutes.